Welcome to the Intentional Encourager podcast, where each episode brings you compelling conversations and stories designed to entertain, enlighten, and encourage. And now here's your host, Brian Sexton. And welcome into the Intentional Encourager podcast. I'm your host, Brian Sexton. Thank you for joining us again today. And again, I have a personal treat to, to share with you today. I have my dear friend, Dr. James B. Cox. I call him Jay. And so I'm going to refer to him through this conversation as Jay. But Dr. Cox has been a dear friend of mine the last several years. And full disclosure, he was the guy that pushed me into doing more public address announcing. And so we'll get into that. We'll get into his story about taking several trips to Africa and things like that. But uh, in between him seeing patients today, he's hopped on to join me on the Intentional Encourager podcast. Jay, how you doing today, brother? Doing very good, Brian. Thanks for having me. Man, it's my pleasure. Jay, I got to start here. I haven't seen you in several months. We're recording this at the, at the back half of the pandemic here. And so it's been several months since I've seen you. How has things been for you in practice? Because you, you've you actually tried to continue to practice and see patients, and there's a lot of discussion and things like that. How has things been different for you seeing patients and treating folks during the midst of this pandemic? Well, uh, initially, all of our elective um, practice was sort of just brought to a halt. Um, I, I remained on call uh, at our emergency room here in, uh, in Taze Valley throughout the entire ordeal. Um, so emergency cases need to be taken care of. And so we, uh, we continued all along uh, taking care of the fractures and the dislocations and, and so forth. Uh, but for about six weeks or so there, um, it was, it was, pretty slow because my practice is probably 20% emergency based and about 80% elective based. I do, as you know, hip and knee replacement surgery, sports medicine, arthroscopy, and, and, and all that was put on the back burner for a little while. Uh, but we continued to do the uh, emergency stuff, which, you know, kept, kept me, you know, in the, in the hospital pretty much every single day through all that. Uh, my days were shorter. Um, things have picked up uh, quite a bit over the last couple of months now, and we're back to essentially full-time in our elective practice, seeing patients in the office. Um, and of course, we're taking all the steps um, for, um, for safety to keep uh, mm -hmm. the people that work in the office safe and the patients safe. Um, uh, you know, the, we, we, we can only, we had to change the way we schedule patients so we don't have a full waiting room. Um, so our hours are expanded essentially. Uh, but it's, it's, it's working, it's, it's working fine right now. And, and, and in terms of my volume, uh, I'm pretty much back to where I was before it all started, just with the, the changes that we mentioned. And Jay, the thing of it is, and, and this is what I couldn't understand because you and I have had tons of conversations about what you do when a person has a degenerative hip condition they have a degenerative knee condition and it's affecting their quality of life they're in pain when they go to sleep they're in pain when they wake up they're in pain constantly because of and it's no secret here in our state of west virginia that that opioid use is is people that that traditionally have been in pain that's what's caused a lot of our issues with opioid use disorder and things like that. It's just the chronic, constant fight with pain. For those people that, that it was quote unquote elective, how did you go about managing those things with those folks? Because again, um, you know, when you need a hip replacement, that's, that's a major deal. That's an ordeal for a lot of folks. And it's not something they consider elective, but a lot of folks in administration were considering it elective at that point. How, how did you help your patients manage through that, those situations like that? that that's a good question and actually a, a, a pretty insightful question, Brian. Um, we, we, we did use a lot more um, 
call in medications to pharmacies, uh, not, not the opioids, but um, the non steroidal anti inflammatory medications, um, a lot of topical preparations. Um, and, and those were, you know, enough in most cases just to keep things at bay for a little bit until we can get them operated on. And then, you know, when, when we got the green light to go ahead and start resuming elective surgery at the hospital, we had a big backlog of, of, of total joints that we had to get in there and get done. Jay, I tell you, man, you've known me a long time. That's kind of the blind squirrel theory in full effect, me asking you a good question. It just doesn't happen too often. <laughs> that was a good question. <laughs> it just doesn't happen too often, you know. It, a lot of times, and folks, I'll tell you this, I've been with Jay in baseball dugouts. I've been with Jay in gyms where we've been together with our kids. Our kids played uh, baseball and basketball together on the same teams for a couple of years. And so, you know, we've been in a lot of different places together. And, and uh, you know, he knows that it, it's – when I when I ask a good question, it's kind of like, man, did I just see like a comment <laughs> go by here or something like that? But It's not that bad, Brian. Yeah, well, I, you know, you work with what you have, Jay. You know I that. Hear you. But, uh, I hear you. But and, – and I'm fascinated. And, and I want to ask one more question around that because, again, I think it's fascinating – to be from somebody in, in your perspective, to be on not necessarily at ground zero as a lot of people were calling it where they were treating emergent COVID cases and things like that. But again, to your patients, those, those were emergent cases. Now that you have started to get back into the swing of things, does it feel like for you that things are getting back to normal or do you still see those things like, man, you know, before February, we were doing it this way and now we're doing it this way. Um, there, there has been, have been a lot of uh, just procedural changes. Uh, you're, you're right about that. Um, and, and I think a lot of the procedural changes are actually good for the long term, even, you know? Um, so some good things have come from this, um, you know, it was, it was hard initially in the hospital um, when we did start um, doing elective cases again. No visitors were allowed initially, and that was kind of stressful for patients. Uh, and then, um, and, and still, it's one visitor at a time. Yeah, you became um, a pretty popular guy because probably for a lot of folks that had to spend a night or two in the hospital after a hip replacement, you were the only guy they saw other than the, exactly. the nurse and staff. <laughs> yes, true. Um, so, and, and, you know, the mask wear is mandatory. And um, the, some, like I said, some of the precautions are just very reasonable um, procedures that I think uh, will probably stick around even after we get past the height of this pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. Jay, I know your story because of the many conversations you and I have had, but I wanted to share your story with this audience and, and, and just, it, it's been an amazing journey for you. You did not grow up in West Virginia. You grew up out in California. Take me as far back as you want to take me in the time that we have today and, and tell folks your story of, of, you know, just some of the things that you've done in your life and, and some of the things that, you know, how you got from point A to point B. Well, um, I, both of my grandfathers were coal miners in West Virginia their entire lives. And my mom and dad are both from southern West Virginia, Logan, West Virginia. I was actually born in Logan, West Virginia, but we moved away when I was a baby. And um uh, really never came back um, in, until our Can adult you blame years. them? Can you blame your folks for not coming back? <laughs> That's another story, but no. Yeah, I know it. I know it, man. <laughs> um, but my dad was a free will Baptist preacher. And um, his he, he felt like his calling was to um, go to small struggling churches and get them built up and and move on. And, and so we moved a lot. We, we lived in Ohio, several different towns in Ohio, 
during my elementary school years. Uh, during the high school years, we were in California. My dad was the dean of the Free Will Baptist Bible College in California um, in pastoring churches. He built a new church while he was out there. Um, so that's that's where um, that's where I went to high school. And that's where I was. Um, I, I went to junior college there. I started my first two years of college there. Um, but I, But I knew I wanted to be a doctor. I knew I wanted to go to medical school. And um, medical school in California is, is um, it, it's, it's kind of tough for a, um, a, a Caucasian male, you know, with the affirmative action initiative. Yeah. Um, you know, there's just not a whole, once all those seats are um, designated um, to minority groups, um, there's there's very maybe five to ten percent that are actually there available so it was actually much 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 more competitive I, I made great grades good good test scores and so forth but um, that's when I started looking seriously about coming back to West Virginia and I learned about the West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine and and the more I learned the more I thought you know that's where I want to go to school and that's you know typically people will apply to 10 or 15 different medical schools I applied to one I'm like if, if I don't get in there then I'll, I'll take a step back and see what I, I, I need to do from there but I came back to Cal, uh, West Virginia from California for my last two years I graduated from Marshall um, uh, went to school in Lewisburg one of the best experiences ever um, I, I did my orthopedic residency uh, in Ohio in Dayton Ohio so I was five years there and um, when I came back, I, I went back to my hometown of Logan for one year. And um, it, that was um, eventful. Uh, the hospital got in a lot of trouble. The hospital administrator administration got in a lot of trouble. Um, and so after that first year, I was already looking for a, a, a new place to practice. And that's when I discovered um, Taze Valley. And, and I've been here ever since. And you know, it's, hey, Jay, I, and, and I'm going to jump in there, but, sure. but, you know, for, for you, you know, a lot of kids, especially today, they'll have their five or 10 schools. And I don't, you know, I may, it's very rare for a young person. You and I have been around a lot of young people. It's very rare that a, that a student locks into a school and has that pathway. So when, when you came to Marshall, and by the way, go herd, I'm a Marshall grad myself. Yeah. Yeah. So, sure. but, but when you, when you locked in there, did you know at that point that you wanted to study orthopedics or were you looking for a career? Because some people go to med, they'll say, I want to go to medical school. Well, what do you want to study? Well, I want to be a doctor. Did you, did you pretty well lock in and know, Hey, this is exactly the career path I want to take in medicine? Well, interestingly enough, um, you probably remember an old uh, classic television show called MASH. I remember uh, it well, yeah. I was, I was fascinated with that show, and, I, and I wanted, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a general surgeon, and um, I, I wanted to be Hawkeye, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, and, and really through my first uh, couple years of medical school, um, that, that was my intention, but you, your last two years of medical school, clinical rotations, as I'm sure you know, and so that's when you get out and you, you rotate month to month on different services, different hospitals, and, and the first time, and I took an orthopedic uh, elective because you have to do at least one orthopedic elective, and it was fairly early on in my third year there. And, and once I saw those surgeons and the, and, the, and the power tools and the plates and the screws and that immediate gratification of taking a horribly broken bone to, you know, perfectly normal alignment with stability, I, I was hooked. Uh, I was totally drawn in. So from, from that point forward, and I was a little, you know, orthopedics is very, very competitive to get into um, residency. So I was kind of late in the game, you know, getting my ducks lined up for for acceptance into an orthopedic residency but god blessed and um and, and i ran into the right people at the right time 
and and I got into the best orthopedic residency program the osteopathic world has to offer there in Dayton and um, training second to none and with my with my training there uh, it's five years so there's a lot of elective months where you can go wherever and and I've gotten to go all over the country um, training with some of the best orthopedic surgeons in their specialties um, all, all over the country and and that's um, I, I'm, I'm very, very grateful for my training. You mentioned MASH, and I'll say this. My career path and my life path was following more of Jamie Farr's character than it, than it would have been the Hawkeye. I'd have been the guy that was just totally off the rails, you know. But uh, and, and, I don't think you would look very good in the wig, though. Oh, man. Yeah, I couldn't have gone there. No, I don't look very yeah. good in this wig, let alone some something else. But you, you mentioned the people that you've been around. And, and for those that follow sports, you had a stint in Birmingham, Alabama with a guy named Dr. James Andrews. When, when you think about the work that he's done in the last 30 years, I don't think, Jay, that there's a sports fan that, that is really invested in professional and college sports that doesn't know who Dr. James Andrews is because of the high-profile athletes that he has, has repaired different parts of the of the body orthopedically what was that like being around him and seeing some of the 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 high i don't want to say high dollar i want to say high performing um guys would walk in to get fixed because they were in the middle of long-term contracts that were very lucrative and this was the guy that was going to help them finish that contract or maybe get to yeah. that next contract what was it like being around a guy like dr andrews uh, it, it's it's another world. Um, there in his hospital, he has um, he has his own wing of the hospital. He did in Birmingham. He's since moved to Florida, as you know. But um, he had a um, a press conference room, and every day after surgery, he would spend half hour, forty five minutes in his press conference room up on the podium, giving updates on the surgeries on the these famous athletes that he worked on through the day, answering questions and so forth. Um, you just you just don't see a surgeon go into a press conference room after cases very often. Um, no, nobody's asking you to go to a press conference no, after, you not, do a, after you do a knee replacement. Not yet. I keep waiting, but no. Um, and, and the not only were the 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 patients high profile, but um, I don't know if you remember Eric Hyden, the um, the speech skater, yeah, the Olympic Goldmouth. speech skater, yeah. He, he he's an orthopedic surgeon and he was doing his fellowship with Dr. Andrews while I was there. So I got to hang out with him for a few months. Um, pretty, pretty amazing stuff. You know, and, and that's the thing, Jay, as hyper obsessed with our, as our society is with sports, you know, everybody, you know, there's reporters there and they're coming there going, okay, well, the fans of, this particular team want to know, okay, how long's the recovery period and things like that. And you think back the last, oh my goodness, probably, when, when was that time for you that you were with Dr. Andrews? How long ago was that for you? That would have been 1998. So now we've got yeah. HIPAA, now we've got HIPAA regulations in place that have come since then. Yes. And, and now you have to be very careful that that you have to have that athlete's release in a lot of cases to share information with the news media and, and things like that. Uh, but back then, it was very common, right, to, 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 for him to walk out and go, hey, I've got 30 minutes. You know, I'll tell you what we did in the surgery. I'll tell you how, yeah. we, how we did it, things like that. That had to be kind of surreal that, that, that you're watching him talk to people that had no medical training. You know what he did. But how was he able to communicate that to people that weren't necessarily proficient or knowledgeable about orthopedics? Uh, Jimmy Andrews, if, if you've ever um, heard him talk or had a conversation with him, he is a, he's a down-to-earth, straight-shooter guy. And, and he just has a knack for relating to people. And, and, and he could probably – explain the stock market to you in a, in a terms that you could understand. He's just very gifted with that. And, and you know, he's got that, 
that, that Southern draw and um, he's a charming guy, you know, um, he, he's an effective communicator. What do you take in, in it and apply to your own practice? that you learn from guys like that? Because you're around a lot of different orthopedic surgeons that have their own way of, of brilliance. They have their own, you know, they, they're, they're gifted in certain areas. What were some of the things that you learned being around these people that help you in your practice today? One, one thing that really struck me when I was, uh, I was there um, and I wasn't with Dr. Andrews every day. There's a whole a team of uh, surgeons there. Um, but Dr. Andrews is, um, he's, he's busy guy, uh, obviously sees a lot of patients, but, um, he, he, he took time with every patient, you know, and he, and he would explain things. He would sit down and talk to him and you could tell that he actually cared. You know, he showed that compassion. And um, I, I, I think I expected just this superstar, you know, surgeon going in and, and with this haughty attitude and get in, get out, and um, just see how much money we can make today. And, and, and he was really just the opposite. And, and still one of the you know, most brilliant surgeons that we, that we have. Um, so I, I, I learned there that you could, you could be both. You could be a great surgeon. You could be compassionate. You could spend time with patients, and and people appreciate that. You, you know, especially, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sure it would work the same way in a big city like Philadelphia or New York, but especially down here in West Virginia, you know, people, um, they appreciate you spending time and explaining, and um, and and I do care about them, yeah. and I and I try to let that show. Yeah, you, you do. There's no question about that. I've got to ask you, you've become involved in the last several years. And a couple of years ago, you took your youngest son, Caleb, to Africa. And yes. you've been involved in a project called 1040i. And it's a, a fantastic uh, project. Go to, go to 1040i.org to learn more about that. How did you get involved with those folks? And what's the, what's the one story that, that that you can share from a trip over there that will, will you'll never forget that it, that impacted you in, in a profound way. Well, I, I got involved again through um, our church. My my dad as a as a as a pastor, he he's heavily involved in the Free Will Baptist organization nationally and at the state level. Um, and um, there's there's a a minister, a missionary named Mike Cousino, who's based out of California, but um, he has been a missionary to Ivory Coast. Uh, his, his kids were raised in, in Ivory Coast. He was there for, I think, almost uh, about 25 years. Um, but, he's, but his home base is in Oklahoma, and that's where um, his, he met his wife and where his wife was from. Um, and during a national association of free will baptists that happens annually my dad was talking to mike and mike was telling him that he's trying to get this project up and running and and dad told him that i was just um out of my residency hadn't been in practice for too long um but i was a practicing orthopedic surgeon so they exchanged contact information and and and, and mike got a hold of me um, and it was, and I had been in practice too long and I, and I was sort of at the time uncomfortable, you know, wanting to leave for two weeks in, in, in February. Um, but, uh, it, it, it took me a, a year or two and it took Mike actually a year or two to get the project off the ground. Um, so I actually was scheduled to go the very first time with him back in 2006 2005, I think it was. Um, but then I had to, right at the last minute, I had to have an open heart surgery to fix this leaky valve. And so I, I couldn't make it that year, but the next year I was on board and, and I have been ever since. Um, and, and it's really been a, a life-changing experience um, to be able to, um, just to see how, how people live in, in those conditions. 
but not only they they're not just living they're they're actually thriving and and there's a lot of sadness and, and a lot of misery but the 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 family bonding is unbelievable um it, I, you, you can learn a lot about how to deal with life from those folks and it, and it applies anywhere even in my own life here um but you, you you're there for half a day and you just fall in love with the with the people the 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 society um and and that that burden and it's a burden but it's not it's not a bad thing yeah. it's it's a burden that i that i feel like almost a responsibility to to go and help now um and, and boy it's rewarding um i i I hadn't done club foot surgery since I was in my residency training because we just don't do club foot surgery here in the United States really that much. When, when kids are born with club feet, we immediately start doing corrective casting and we change the cast every couple of weeks and get more and more correction. They don't, obviously they don't have any of that. So um, I, I'd been going for probably five years when they, um, they introduced me to a little kid in the village that they spotted some of the teams were going out to um, to deliver medical supplies and things like that to other villages, and they spotted this little guy stumbling around, bumbling, falling to his knees, and, and they they went and asked. They found his mom, who was a teenager, um, and asked if they could bring him to me to look at. And when I saw him, he had just the worst club foot deformity you'd ever seen. I mean, he was walking on his ankles and 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 it would take three or four steps and just fall get up take three or four steps and just fall uh it was really sad to watch mm -hmm. and he's a sweet little guy and he had this long name that none of us could pronounce so we all just started calling him junior um and, and you know i saw him that year and and i'm thinking i i need to i need to help this kid but i i wasn't ready to do his club foot surgery just then so i i i, I made him promise to get back next year when we come in February and and they did and while I was during that time I, I was hitting the books <laughs> going back and reviewing club foot surgery um, I actually called a dear friend of mine who is the head of pediatric orthopedics at Cincinnati Children's and and asked him to come up and say Chuck I, I want to come up and watch you do a couple club foot surgery scrub in with you and he's like, Jerry, we don't do club foot surgery here. And I said, I know we don't, but I figured you had a few up here at the specialty center. He said, really, no. So um, I, I did my very first club foot surgery on Junior, both sides. And, and, you know, to see Junior walking around today like nothing ever happened, it, uh, it chokes you out. Yeah. It's, it's really amazing. Yeah. Um, and Junior's how old now, Jake? Junior has got to be 12 by now. He was so, four so we basically the surgery. the surgery, because I would think, you know, from, from the time he's, he's a baby, there's got to be some wear and tear on those bones. And obviously you repaired that, but yeah, that, I mean, that's got to be amazing. Just because you went to Africa, that kid's life is forever changed. Yeah, forever. And, and since then I've done, 47 club foot surgeries. <laughs> Man. So I've probably done I've probably done more club foot surgery than um, most orthopedic surgeons anywhere. You know, Jay, I've got to yeah. ask you one more question, and 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 uh, I mean, I so appreciate your time because you got to see patients. That you got to go do your real job. You know, it's yeah. But uh, what's your biggest piece of intentional encouragement for folks? Because again, you you've led an amazing life and still helping people to this day and 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 man our friendship is a gift i appreciate it so much what's your biggest piece of intentional encouragement for folks i got to say um look at look at your strengths what you can offer and offer it get out and and help Whatever, whatever your forte is, and it may be your work, but if you can find a way to apply that 
elsewhere and, and just to be of help, there's nothing to me, there's nothing more encouraging than that. There's nothing that um, is more gratifying than that. Just to, just to be a help. Um, and, and everybody's got strengths, you know? Um, and, and, you know, for me, it's, you know, pray about it. Um, listen to what God's telling you and just do it. Um, it. We all have to make our way in life, right? We all have to earn our living. We all have to um, look out for our families, but, you know, find some time to reach out and, 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 and apply what you do best in other situations that will help people. It's gratifying. Ma'am, well, well said. Let folks know how they can connect with you, ma'am, because I'm sure once they hear this podcast, they're going to want to reach out and connect with you, and uh, I would highly recommend you do so. Jay's an incredible guy and a, and a great friend. So um, I, I, my, uh, my email is jabencox at gmail.com. Um, my office is um, – here in Tays Valley on the main road, I'm with CAMC. You can find me through there if you, if you need um, orthopedic services. But yeah, um, reach out anytime uh, through my, through my uh, email account. I'd, I'd be glad to, uh, to hear, uh, hear from other folks out there. And we've got listeners all over the world, man, Australia and, and, and different parts of the world, Canada. That's so, awesome. you know, I mean, yeah, that's great. All, all out of West Virginia, man. And, and, and yeah. for Jay and I, in, in just a month or so, we'll be getting back together. He's the team doctor of, of a, the Christian school that my son graduated from. His son's a senior there this year, Calvary Baptist Academy, as well as Taze Valley Christian School does the team doctoring there. So I'm, I'm going to get ready to see this guy a lot again for the next four months and it's always a joy jay thank you so much for joining me today on the intentional encourager podcast man i appreciate you brian thank you i appreciate your friendship and the work you're doing amazing keep it up thank you my thanks as always to producer bryce sexton and technical advisor matt Meads, and the ultimate thanks goes to the lord jesus christ who provides intentional encouragement every day his world. And until next time, remember, everyone, everywhere, at any time, and any place, can be an intentional.